Hello there, I'm Mount Pain 27 and this is Dean of Doom, the show where we give grades to classic and contemporary Doom wads. Why? Because ranking things is fun. Today's episode will be dedicated to Community Chest 2, a megawad released in 2004, one year after the first one. I know what you're thinking. Why review the sequel before the original Mount Pain? Well, I have four reasons. One, I played this one first. Two, Community Chest 1 is... not so good. Three, Community Chest maps typically have nothing in common except the year they were released. Each entry in the series is cobbled together from Doom World submissions, often showcasing new designers, contemporaneous fads in mapping, and held together by a handful of high-profile contributions to the Doom community's old guard. TLDR, Community Chest 2 is as good a place to start as any. Finally, there's one particular map in CC2 I really want to talk about. You'll know when we get to it. Before we dive in, here's how the show works. We give each level in the WAD two grades, one for quality and one for difficulty. We grade quality from A to F, and difficulty from X to E. X for extreme, E for easy, and A through D in between. A grade A level is fun, memorable, visually distinctive, creative, and a fair challenge. Lower grades indicate the level lacks some or all of these qualities. Bear in mind that as Doom players go, I'm a C or C plus at best, and the only people sure to agree with these reviews 100% have names that start with M and rhyme without pain, so our definitions of difficulty and great map design will surely differ. Disagreeing is part of the fun, after all. At the end of the day, this show is about spreading the joy of Doom, so let's do so. For the new viewers in the audience, here are the rules. 1. We play on Ultraviolence. 2. We play each level from a pistol start. 3. In order to review the WAD, I must have played it at least twice. 4. Saves are allowed but discouraged. And 5. I go for 100% kills in all levels, making exceptions in cases where it's just not worth it. I play on Z-Doom, with compatibility settings on Strict. Now, to the WAD. Map 1, The Furnace. Exactly what you'd expect from the author of Scythe, The Furnace is a snug, compact map with deceptively thorough detailing and palatable fights. It's a mature opener. Unfortunately, the majority of the next 31 levels don't emulate Alm's dedication to efficiency. Grade B, difficulty D-. Map 2, Coolant Platform. I played this map for the first time three times, because nothing about it ever stuck with me. It's like a better lit version of Doom's shareware episode, offering no resistance and less intrigue. You might know Yori better as Trevor Primitt, who authored Back to Saturn X's Mix Up the Satellite, though it's hard to see any resemblance between that map and Coolant Platform. Grade B-, difficulty D-. Map 3, Slige Control. The first of three maps by the Flange Peddler, Slige Control is nothing special in terms of challenge, but pays careful attention to lighting and architecture. Lots of beveled corners, borders, trims, and carefully drawn shading here. Funny thing is, the Flange Peddler didn't actually design this map, strictly speaking. See, Slige isn't just a made-up word, it's an early 2000s program that could randomly generate Doom maps. According to Doom Wiki, this map was born from a contest in which participants were given Slige maps and charged with making making them look like the participants' own work without changing Slige's original layouts or structures. It's a testament to Flange Peddler's eye for detail that I had no idea this map was made by a computer, though in hindsight, Slige Control's pervading symmetry is a little suspicious. Grade B, difficulty D-. Map 4, Deja Vu. Everybody, meet Gene Bird. If your community megawatt is in need of a disruptive shift in pacing, quality, and level of enjoyment, Gene Bird is your man. He's an auteur, like Ed Wood or Tommy Wiseau. The rest of the world may have moved on, but Gene Bird still lives in the year 1994, when interconnected flat boxes filled with random monsters and decorations were the gold standard, and texture variation was just a suggestion. Gene Bird thought he named this map Deja Vu because two of its rooms are identical and mirrored, but it's really a reference to the sensation you get from playing any of his five maps in this megawad because they're all equally ugly and shit. Okay, I tried making light of it, but I actually do kind of hate this guy. Deja Vu is awful. It makes the master levels look like art. I've seen maps that feel like a bunch of different ideas haphazardly stuck together, but I legitimately believe that Gene Bird hits the refresh button on his brain with each new room. He starts with marble, then goes to stone, then wood, then brown brick and concrete, then you're in a sewer, then you're in a monster jail, then you're in a bedroom? These secrets are a laughing stock. All of them are either in plain sight or behind anonymous walls Wolfenstein style. Predictably, the combat is garbage. Deja Vu is pretty much super shotgun the map, but unfortunately, not trivial, owing to Gene Bird's fondness for placing gobs of hit scanners, revenants, mancubi, and hell knights in clusters with zero forethought. Folks, I played this three times, so you don't have to. Grade F, difficulty C+. <laughs> map 5, Elixir. Would you believe me if I told you this is the second hardest map in Community Chest 2? Yep, 
Map 5. Elixir is set in a health potion manufacturing plant, which is ironic because there's hardly any f***ing health in it. Your biggest challenge will be not running out of ammo, and that's not just for pistol starters or UV maxers either. If you're not berserk punching and infighting until the cows come home, there is a possibility that you will be unable to finish this map, period, even with saves. Elixir is full of teleport traps. Almost any critical item you grab unleashes a mess of monsters not only where you are, but where you were. Half the map is dark as sh** and stuffed to the gills with hit scanners, so it's easy to get winged or bitten by a specter, not a good situation when every health point counts. The plant itself is claustrophobic and full of tripwires that will flood the hallways with monsters you won't have the cover or ammunition to deal with. Patience is key. This is some of the most boring footage I've ever collected. Half of it is waiting for monsters to kill each other. When you reach the switch that opens the exit, you'll get the full picture I'm trying vainly to paint with words here. The factory floor fills with macubi, hell knights, and imps. Arachnatrons teleport into the hallway above you. The caves outside get repopulated with even more heavies, and a cyber demon has decided to park himself by the exit. Note that it's very tricky, but possible, to slip past the spiders. It's possible to sneak out of the caves alive, but if you think you're sneaking past Mr. Sybe Syb, you're mistaken. To reach the exit, you'll need to carefully sneak around these decorations, one at a time, and there's no way you can pull that off with an audience, especially when that audience has a rocket launcher. This map is straight up sadistic and virtually impossible to beat without knowing what's coming. Thankfully, the rest of the megawatt is not this hard. Grade B minus, difficulty A plus. Map six, the view. After grinding through Elixir, the view's rapid fire delivery and open spaces are a welcome sight. Monster occupancy is on the high side, but the fights never drag out unnecessarily, and the visuals, while uneven, are bold and colorful. By far my favorite part of the map is this hillside finale where you can start one heck of a brouhaha by triggering all four of these monster closets at once. I've enjoyed this map more every time I've replayed it. Grade B+, plus, difficulty B. Map 7, To Hell and Back. To Hell and Back wants desperately to be a showstopper, sitting pretty at the map 7 slot and sporting one of CC2's most memorable premises. To exit the map, you'll need to get a teleporter up and running, warp into hell, grab a demonic key, and escape with your life. The flange peddler pulls out all the stops. His map is bursting with texture variety, intricate lighting and geometry, and a few well-placed boom features. The hell section puts an eerie filter over your vision. I'm not sure how this is done, but the effect is disconcerting. To Hell and Back is clearly a labor of love. The downside is it's very confusing. The hyper-detailed rooms tend to blend together, and it's not always clear whether doors are unlocked, locked behind keys, or closed until you have the right switch. You may find yourself running around in circles, even on second and third playthroughs, and there's too much dead air between finding keys and hitting the right colored switches, which get lost in the busy scenery. The journey to hell, while dramatic, takes a long time to arrive, and the final fight is an anticlimactic dead simple rehash. It's almost a slam dunk, but not quite. Grade B+, difficulty C+. Map 8, The Pit. Hmm, The Pit. Nice title. How'd you come up with it, Gene Bird? The Pit is even more primitive than Deja Vu. It looks like it came out before Doom 2. It's so... I can't even find the words to describe the incompetence on display here. The pit is consistently hideous, boring, and redundant. The titular pit is actually a sluggish elevator and serves no purpose beyond justifying the title and ballooning the level's runtime. I think the problem with this map is it's a comedy, but Gene Bird directed it like a drama. Oh look, it's a BFG just sitting there on the floor with an invulnerability you don't need. <laughs> oh look, a room full of monsters, and behind this door, another room full of monsters just like it. What a story, Mark. Kinda like deja vu. Oh wait, that was last map. Don't forget about this secret, which takes you to another room that looks just like the other two. I'm so happy I have you as my best friend, and I love Lisa so much. The Pit is the new worst level I've reviewed for this show. Congrats, Gene Bird. You lowered the bar. Grade F, difficulty C. <laughs> Map 9, the Transformer, also known as the Shotgunner map. No, really, out of 80 monsters, 56 of them are shotgunners. The name of the game is find the secret chain gun or die a lot, because you'll have minimal ammo to deal with the imps pouring in like gangbusters at the start. Get past the opening and the level pretty much finishes itself. Normally, I'd wince at Graf Saul's placement of six secrets in a map that takes less than four minutes to finish, but today I learned that he's one of the minds behind Z Doom, so he gets a pass. The Transformer is an odd duck. Grade C minus, difficulty D plus. Map 10, intermission. I always have a better time than I expect to in this quiet little outpost. The dark and understated atmosphere reminds me of TNT's middle third, but the rest of it is Eric Alm light. The monster placement is spare, the visuals clean, and the runtime short. The caged cyber demon at the end is the only fight that stands out, but even then, Voltaface gives the player everything they'll need. CC2's intermission comes a little early, but it's welcome. Grade B minus, difficulty D minus. Map 11, Beyond Pain. 
Despite its title, which would better fit a Gene Bird map, Beyond Pain is of neutral difficulty, a nondescript facility that adds yet more green slime to the Megawad. The visuals are on par with Doom 2, and the layout is pretty confusing. It's one of those maps where it's not immediately apparent what most of the switches do, but the music gives the whole thing a sort of chipper tone, and some of the action is... Okay, I guess. I'm kind of split on this map. Sometimes I have a good time, sometimes it's a slog. For this recording, it was the latter. Grade C+, difficulty C. Map 12, Redemption. Yeah, Gene Bird wishes this was his redemption. Another pilfered title, another swing and a miss. Redemption is another linear plod through a series of blissfully inconsistent boxy rooms, killing clumps of randomly placed monsters and finding obvious secrets. But I'll give credit where it's due. Redemption is a better map than Gene Bird's first two. He actually attempts to use the third dimension a few times here and there, and his detailing surpasses low expectations. I even kind of enjoy the killing spree at the end. Redemption? No. Stopped the bleeding? Sure. Grade D, difficulty C. Map 13, Annihilation Invention. The pleasantest surprise on replays of Community Chest 2 was Annihilation Invention, a map that initially blended into the morass of averageness that is CC2's first half, but upon revisiting emerged as one of my favorite maps in the Megawad. It's another poison-themed tech base, but Siren's acumen for action elevates it. The map starts off with a satisfying hitscan circuit, its halls ripe with explosive barrels, and maintains a brisk clip for most of its runtime, pausing only to let you gather gettable but gratifying secrets. Annihilation Invention has aged really well for a 16-year-old map. The aesthetics are airtight and pleasantly vintage, the layout helps rather than hinders the player, and the fights are explosive, if not terribly challenging. I did have some trouble getting three cacodemons to teleport in. Not sure if I screwed up or the map did, but there's no need to point fingers when there's this much fun to be had. Grade A-, difficulty C-. Map 14, Shadow of Evil. Stop the presses! I found back-to-back -back fun maps in Community Chest 2! Mephisto's Shadow of Evil is a hell of a lot better than his mausoleum, a handsome wooden demon prison that's short, visually distinctive, and finally breaks up the Doom 2 midi parade with a cut from Rise of the Triad. The only fight that will punish you for running in heedlessly is this red key room with a cool design in the ceiling. Reminds me of the prison room in Map 7 of TNT Evolution. The blockage of barons and hell knights at the end might lean on your ammo counter a bit, but otherwise poses little threat. I like this one. It's got polish and poise, two commodities this wad is short on. Grade B+, plus, difficulty C+. Plus. Map 15, City Heat. Hunker down, because this one's gonna take you a while. City Heat is an effects-heavy magnum opus from Stephen Clark, aka the Ultimate Doomer, that almost earns him his highfalutin title. This map packs over 400 foes, and you've got nine numbered buildings to explore, each with two switches, one secret and one regular, that open doors guarding their corresponding exits. During my first playthrough, I only found like two secret switches without cheating, and I still have trouble remembering them all. I don't even think that's a me problem. The Ultimate Doomer really hid that secret exit. City Heat's got a whole bag of mapping magic tricks, everything from conveyor belts to bridges to slopes to deep water effects. Problem is, except for the conveyor belts, the results are pretty jank. The bridges are full of holes and work better as caco nets than what they're designed for. Building four slopes make you feel like you're on a skating rink, and the slime has the opposite effect. You thought Doom Eternal was bad. The high friction effect here is brutal. Clever on paper, maybe, but very annoying in practice. Good thing the rest of City Heat is exciting and set to a snazzy custom midi. this map is a hard hour if you're unprepared. The methodical grind and a couple of hair-raising fights make this one of the most challenging maps in the Megawad. Grade A-, difficulty A-. Map 31, Idee Fix. CC2's first secret level is a real what the hell? moment. It looks like a Tyson map at the start, pitting you against Revenants, Hell Knights, and Pinkies in a small room, but beat that rap and the level's nearly done. Find the red key, claim your BFG, and make mincemeat of everything else. I can kinda see what Sarge Baldy was going for. Eday Fix strives to be a combat puzzle, but it's not much fun when it only takes one move to solve it. I suppose it doesn't suck, but it's a little too short and strange to get a seal of approval from me. I can only imagine it was shoved in the secret slot because they didn't know what else to do with it. Grade C, difficulty C-. minus. Map 32, Sodding Death. Hushed, vicious, and vast, Sodding Death is one of the real lookers in this megawatt. An overgrown fortress dug into the mountains. Chopkinska's tiled land masses, despite their vanilla-ness, are organic and impressive, and you'll quickly come to appreciate all that space and light when you plunge into the vine-covered ruin where the real level begins. Its musty passageways are full of cloak-and-dagger ambushes, the walls teem with hit scanners sniping from the crevices, hell knights maraud around like they own the place, and the archviles are turned up to eleven. 
No, really. The jump from Hurt Me Plenty to Ultra Violence is a hike from one arch file to eleven. Missing the super shotgun on my second playthrough compounded their unpleasantness, and my advice to you is, don't do that. Sodding Death has a few sadistic surprises, and the uncanny midi doesn't go easy on your nerves, but I think the map's biggest drawback is its obtuse progression. I couldn't tell you how to get the red key if I tried, and the map suffers pervasively from I sure hope that switch did something syndrome. It becomes more enjoyable after a couple of playthroughs, but I'm not sure it's worth the effort in the end. Grade B? Difficulty, B+. Map 16, Spirit World HQ. Seriously, can this guy not come up with his own level names or what? Gene Bird delivers yet another gutter ball with Spirit World HQ, which is half ugliest city level I've ever played, and half ideas for rooms that Gene Bird had after breakfast, strung together by teleporters. The city portion is hilariously underdetailed and full of monsters and windows. How fun. Make sure you finish up your business here before proceeding to the second half, as there's no way to teleport back. Spirit World HQ is, again, unwaveringly linear after that, but you can always count on Gene Bird to find new and creative ways to waste your time. His secret are either unmissable or unbearable. Pressing on this skull doesn't give you any feedback but opens up a nearby supply pocket and a switch that, come to think of it, might be required for you to finish the level. I'm not sure, and I'm not going to play the level again to find out. You'll spend the last 10 minutes of the map looking for a yellow key which opens a door that literally doesn't appear until you find it. Why would you bother hiding the door if it's locked? Or why would you bother locking it if it's hidden? The saddest thing is that it seems like Gene Bird is genuinely trying to use his imagination. This warehouse full of decorations got me thinking that Spirit World HQ is supposed to be like a Doom level workshop, a storage place for raw map making materials guarded by demons. But that's giving Gene Bird far more credit than he deserves. Spirit World HQ is a total disaster, only outdone in drudgery and ugliness by the pit. Grade F. Difficulty, C+. Map 17, Through the Black. This effort from Andy Lever displays an economy of design that I greatly respect. Through the Black is short, slick, and hard-bitten. Bring your A-game to this one because the fights are quick and deadly. My personal favorite, this room with chain gunners and a posse of revenants, will shred you if you're not ready. Survive that, and everything else can be eliminated with a bit of patience. Although, ammo-wise, you're going to be up against it, unless you can find the mother load in this secret. Look at this. It almost makes me feel guilty to take it. Through the Black is solid stuff, reminiscent of Alien Vendetta in terms of quality and mood. Grade B+, difficulty B-. Map 18, Internal Reaches 3. This map took several hours of my life that I wish I could have back. Kaiser clearly gives a damn. This map is thorough, detailed, and sophisticated. Someone's liable to chide me if I don't say this spiral staircase is a technical marvel, but I don't think Doom ever needed room over room to be enjoyable, and the stairs can malfunction with infuriating results. Hackery aside, Internal Reaches 3 has one glaring problem. It's boring. Too much backtracking, way too many secrets with hidden enemies, and the payoff is a milquetoast cyberdemon fight, which is yet another thing, in addition to its midi and map number, that Internal Reaches 3 shares with TNT Evolution's Map 18, Mill. An equally boring, clumsy, and abstruse experience that I only give a pass because I played it 50 times and nostalgia is my weakness. For Kaiser, there is no such get out of jail free card. Grade C minus, difficulty C plus. Map 19. The Marvelous 3. The Marvelous 3 is the most work I've ever seen invested in a Doom level I find totally uncompelling. For God's sake, the guy gives you a berserk and invulnerability for the only tricky fight in the level. Herogen 2 has absolutely no knack for combat, or secret hiding for that matter, but the man put more effort into this hole in the ground than Gene Bird put into his entire corpus. It's like an architect got to fiddling with Doom Builder one day and dropped monsters in as an afterthought. Noticeably gifted, but very odd. Grade C+, difficulty B. Map 20, Enigma in which the flange peddler turns to the dark side. Enigma is exceptionally irritating, despite its obvious grasp of fundamentals. Reason being that out of all the maps in Commercial Doom, the flange peddler chose to emulate E3M7 Limbo, known for its confusing layout and excessive use of damaging floors. Enigma's a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside a pile of bullshit, with hardly a memorable fight to be had amidst all the switch and teleport hunting. And I'll tell you what, I've had it with Vanilla Doom Hell. I played too many maps that use this exact proportion of marble, metal, and flesh. Perhaps it's a confluence of negative associations unluckily dragging this one down in my eyes, but Enigma is a hard pass for me. Grade C, difficulty C+. Map 21, Undead Nation. Ugh. It feels like being stuck back in Doom 1 for most of Undead Nation with its shotgun on zombie action and dark halls playing in the background, but its orthogonal layout and low resting heart rate compare unfavorably to almost any Romero tech base. You probably shouldn't ignore the map's 8 secrets though you'll want to, because ammo's scarce and much needed for the final fight. This Hell Knight and Pinky Mob will eat your remaining ammo, and then Draconio six an arch file and his hounds on you which consistently runs my rocket supply dry. Don't let boredom glaze your eyes over, and you'll make it out of this one alive. Grade D+, difficulty C+. Map 22, Thematic Elements. 
Thematic Elements is a Franken map full of tremendously violent set pieces, one of the most unlikely success stories in this megawad, and probably its second biggest sleeper hit next to Annihilation Invention. Lutrov's visuals are chronically inconsistent, but Jimmy, whom Doomworld credits with the combat design, doesn't play patty cake. You're gonna want to take the middle teleporter and grab the BFG right away, because there's a mob of chain gunners, three hell knights, and an arch file in the first room. After that, it's a cavalcade of hit scanners and pitiless teleport traps, culminating in this epic throwdown, which makes refreshing good use of its crate maze. When you manage to kill everything, two archviles spawn right on top of the corpses, and killing them concludes part one of three. Thematic Elements never manages to top this, and the rest of the map gives you significantly more health and munitions than you'll need if you're playing responsibly. I really hated this map at first. It's a mean SOB and 10 minutes too long, but I've come to appreciate its energy and patchwork quality, and I can't deny that it contains some of the best action in the Megawad. Grade A-, minus, difficulty A. Map 23, Death Mountain. One of the obvious standouts in CC2, Death Mountain is upbeat, aesthetically focused, and technically impressive. Cyber Menace sends the player spelunking through a network of caves connected by silent teleporters. When you walk through a hole in the wall, you're actually teleporting to a new location, a trick that's as clever as it is exploitable. You'll be running into caverns so packed with foes that it becomes a feasible option to either backpedal out of the room and quickly re-enter to telefrag them before they can follow you, or backpedal out of the room and lead them away from the door in cases where the room you're teleporting from is located on the opposite side of the door owned by the room you're teleporting to. Confused? Don't be. It's Doom. Just kill the monsters and you win. I don't know anything about the Legend of Zelda, but apparently Death Mountain is loosely based on a location of the same name in that series. Death Mountain puts the squeeze on you early and its arenas can get congested, but I have to say the only parts of the level I don't enjoy are the overstuffed caves, specifically the monster palooza guarding the exit. The Cyber Demon battle in the Dragon's Belly is probably the high point of the level for me, though Cyber Menace's stylistic decisions, the stark blue sky, lighting, and loyalty to his theme, are the real MVP here. Grade A-, difficulty B+. Map 24, The Mucus Flow. <sighs> if The Mucus Flow wasn't in Community Chest 2, I would not have made this episode. The Mucus Flow is the Alpha and Omega, the Scene Stealer, the Lightning Rod. In the words of one Doom World writer, the map we remember from Community Chest 2. Sprung from the unfathomable mind of BPRD, the mucus flow takes place in an almost abandoned facility swallowed by nature and inundated with slime. You're given a king's ransom of health and ammo at the start, but all your weapons except the super shotgun are locked behind color-coded bars. Don't expect to see any more health or ammo except in mostly locked up depots scattered across the map. In the first flooded building, you'll find your best friend, the chainsaw, and when you think you're ready, poke your head into the valley, which is studded with guard towers in each a chain gunner. Oh, just so you know, there are 540 chain gunners in this level, and most of them are off screen, ready and able to teleport in and replace their fallen brethren. Even if you brought a backpack full of ammo with you from the previous level, it is physically impossible to kill every chain gunner by hand. So sprint through the canyon and pray for good luck, shove your way past the imps, arachnid and chain gunners guarding the front door, and find an absolutely critical secret. Fair warning, if you've never played this map and want to experience it for yourself, I advise stopping the video now and skipping to this timestamp. Pressing on a specific gemstone in the wall will open a passage to a slimy grotto with six pain elementals, which you'll have to chainsaw. Believe me, you'll want to. When they're dead, you can ride up to the source of the green flood, a big nose sticking out of a rock. Gather what supplies you can and take a good look because you can't come back here. After that comes the exhausting process of whittling down the opposing ranks with infighting and berserk, shooting only in emergencies. Take as little damage as possible. After you manage to negotiate your way to the blue and red keys, knocking out Hell Knights, Revenants, and Pain Elementals alike, it's time to head back. You can traverse the Chain Gunner Valley with the help of a Blur Sphere, but expect to be ambushed by a swarm of Revenants in the dark and an Archfile by the starting Oasis. At this point, you'll have no choice but to open fire, and the effect of pulling the trigger after many white-knuckled minutes is jarring. Only now, armed with a plasma rifle and chain gun, can you hope to wade through the rest of the mucus flow's excoriating pitfalls. Hordes of Hell's higher-ups, snipers in the hallways, pain elementals gushing spawn, and this apocalyptic final act. You'll never have the ammunition to deal with them all. All the while, this impossibly beguiling midi is playing in the background. A glittery, gloomy, nerve-wracking dirge that seethes with paranoia sucks the hope right out of you. In frantic moments, it feels like drowning.
By my reckoning, it's the greatest marriage of map and music there is. When you hit the final switch, the canyon fills with slime, revealing the path to the exit. A strange column of depleted starlight. I can't begin to describe how this map makes me feel. It's horrible and amazing. It feels like the most important level I've ever played, and it's unquestionably BPRD's masterpiece, an uncompromising juggernaut. Speaking of juggernauts, I never would have completed the mucus flow without the help of Jario, a doomed speedrunner whose 31 minute UV max run of this level I studied just to be able to save scum my way through it over the course of a feature film's runtime. Let me put it this way, Sunlost is hard. But the mucus flow is a special kind of challenge. It demands persistence, incredible Tyson skills, and an alignment of heavenly bodies to preserve enough health and procure the right infighting to make it through without saving. The mucus flow is haunting, bleak, and desperately alive. It will never be matched. Grade A+. Difficulty X. Map 25, Desecration. Well. It's no mucus flow. All I can say is, Gene Bird should have called this one Redemption because it's his best map by a mile. The fights feel much less haphazard, the verticality is a welcome change of pace, and the detailing is almost cozy by Gene Bird's standards. I don't like it, per se, but it's a dramatic improvement from his first four offerings, which makes sense because Desecration was the only map he made specifically for this megawatt. The other four were old, standalone releases, presumably included for the sake of getting to 32 maps. In other words, Gene Bird was more sacrificial lamb than undeserving hack. Doesn't make his maps any better, but it softens my heart enough to give Desecration a C, with a difficulty of C. Map 26, Geist Halls. Hey, that's Pink Floyd. Geist Halls is very progressive rock, a long, space-themed level with relatively little substance despite its excellent production quality. Its setting is cool, if a bit inexplicable, with some great secrets and a ubiquitous aura of mystery. Doc Zinn spins a good yarn, but he's a tad overgenerous. Case in point, this invuln you get right before the Cyberdemon finale. I could do without the mishmash of tiny rooms and hit scanners that you'll have to cut through for the red key, but it's a minor quibble. Grade B plus, difficulty D. Map 27, Gethsemane. Remember what I was saying back in Map 20 about having had it with generic hell? Well, here's a generic hell that's actually hell to play. Some things I hate about this map? One, walking in guts slows you down. Two, deep into the code is much too short a midi for a map this size. Three, the platforming, which often goes hand in hand with trollish monster placement. Four, the visuals are overblown and obviously take precedence over the gameplay. Five, the level is winding, backtrack heavy and cumbersome. And six, it seems like every f***ing door needs a switch to open it and then locks behind you. Gethsemane goes out of its way to slow you down, leading you around in circles, obscuring the way forward, hamstringing the player with meaningless obstacle courses and cramped encounters, inflicting pain and tedium wherever possible. It's a joyless waste of time. Grade D minus, difficulty B. Map 28, No Room, in which Linguica intentionally tries to be a tool. No Room is attractive and frequently entertaining, but suffers from its author's repeated efforts to sabotage, annoy, or befuddle the player. The Red Cavern section is undeniably cool looking, and caps off with a double Cyberdemon rocket duel in the middle of a lake of magma, but making your way there is a pain, owing to the lost souls, lack of ammo, obligatory parkour, and Doomguy's inability to look down. I dig this fight with the Spider Demon, but not the arena with the floating skull blocks. Linguica actually said he placed barons on them specifically to thumb his nose at max speedrunners. Aha. Uh -huh. I wonder if that's also why he placed a ridiculously obscure Nazi secret in the first room. The map ends on a big fat f you. A quintuple fake exit that peppers you with surprise chain gunners well past the point of ridiculousness. Linguica doesn't seem to respect the player much, and you know what? I don't respect him much either. Grade C minus, difficulty A. Map 29, Event Horizon. Tell you what. The CC2 folks put the right map at number 29. Event Horizon is a compelling creature feature with solid fights and sweet visuals. The premise of your mission is almost identical to the flange peddlers to hell and back. Root through the tech base for keys, open a portal to hell, wreck house, and get out. Boris Ivansky shows flashes of brilliance. The giant monster's great and could have influenced Syriac Harris. The moment you hit this eye switch and the floors turn to blood is chilling. And look at those ceiling fans. 2004, guys. Not in love with the hell section, it's overlit and underdone in my opinion, but the fight at the top of the tower is good fun, and the map concludes on a strong note. Grade A minus, difficulty C plus. Map 30, in threes, comma, bad things come. The obligatory icon of Sin Map, in threes, is short, but it could have been shorter. The opening, where you're forced to skitter across damaging blood and kill monsters in cramped spaces, is a combat puzzle I don't really enjoy except for the arch file ambush at the end. After that, the only thing left to do is defeat three wall textures by engaging in your three favorite Doom activities, ignoring monsters, gathering keys, and hitting switches. Grade C, difficulty B minus. So, 
Community Chest 2 is the most inconsistent Megawad I've ever played. It's quite the plummet from the mucus flow to Gene Bird, and I've gotta be honest, the mucus flow is an acquired taste, so unless you're a budding aficionado for its brand of artistry, you're going to walk out of CC2 feeling pretty nonplussed. It's a Megawad where you'll spend most of your playing time hoping things will get better. Even the non-filler maps have a way of grinding your gears and or testing your patience. It was a chore to replay, quite honestly, and I have no qualms giving it a C for a final grade. It hangs together uncomfortably and is not to be marathon. Difficulty-wise, it's mostly sedate, but a handful of maps really push the envelope. A B- seems appropriate. Now for my Dean's list. Valedictorian, everyone and their brother already knows what's coming, Map 24, The Mucus Flow. Salutatorian, Map 13, Annihilation Invention. Class President, Map 24, The Mucus Flow. And there's a lot of competition for the dunce cap in this megawad, but I'm going to give it to Map 8, The Pit. Thank you very much for watching, and please feel free to share your thoughts on the wand down below. I'd love to hear what you think, and I'll heart your comments to let you know I've read them. This is Mount Payne 27, and I'll see you in the next episode of Dean of Doom.